Hey everyone, I'm Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. Tonight, we're switching things up a little bit and taking it way, way back to the early 1900s to talk about a female serial killer who was infamous in the way that she tried to hide her crimes. Leonarda Ciencilli was known as Soap Maker of Correggio because she turned her victims into soap and tea cakes. She is quite different than any other serial killer I think I've ever talked about before, and I'm really excited to jump into her story. It's definitely an interesting one. Tonight's episode is sponsored by The Sneeze Guardian. If you or anybody you know are driving for Uber, Lyft, or any of the other rideshare programs out there, you need this, especially in the season of flu and other viruses. It makes a great gift for your rideshare driving friends. Get them a sneeze guard specifically designed to be used inside vehicles. Now only $89 includes free shipping. Arrives within a week, so you'll have it in your car in no time. Get yours today at sneezeguardian.com or click on the link in my show notes. Now let's jump into tonight's episode. Leonardo Ciancilli was born November 14th. 1893 in Montella, which is in the province of Avellino in Italy. Like I said, this case is a big throwback to the tough old days. Leonardo never had a perfect life. It was far from it. And while little is known about her childhood, we do know a few things that may have contributed to the woman she grew up to be. It all started before Leonardo was ever even born. Leonardo's father, Mariano, had raped her mother, Emilia, and to save face, Emilia decided to marry her rapist once she discovered that she was pregnant. As you can imagine, this caused Emilia to have a lot of resentment and hate towards Leonardo, which manifested into physical abuse. With all of the physical and mental abuse she was experiencing, while still a young girl, Leonardo attempted suicide twice. In 1917, she did end up marrying a registry office clerk by the name of Raphael Pansardi. Her parents did not approve of the marriage, as they had planned for her to marry another man. By going against her parents' wishes, she was no longer welcome to stay in the family home, leaving no choice but to move to her husband's town in Loria. And it was at this time that Leonardo claimed that her mother cursed them both. Whether or not you believe in that sort of thing, the couple did suffer from terrible luck. In 1921, they moved to Raphael's native town of Loria Pontenza, and it was here that Leonardo got into a bit of criminal mischief. She was actually sentenced and imprisoned for fraud in 1927. When she was released, the couple moved to Lacedonia, Avellino, for a fresh new start, but it wasn't long before their home was destroyed in the 1930 earthquake. It would later be categorized as one of the most destructive earthquakes in Italian history, a 6.6 magnitude and over 1,400 people died. So they moved once more to Correggia Reggio Emilia, where they opened a small shop. What did the shop sell, you might ask? The answer is soap and cakes. And our story will definitely come back to this soap shop again. Either way, Leonardo was very popular and well-respected within her neighborhood. Leonardo had 17 pregnancies during her marriage, but she lost three of the children to miscarriages. Ten more of her children died in their youth. Consequently, she was heavily protective of the four surviving children. Her fears were fueled by a warning that she had received sometime earlier from a fortune teller, who said that she would marry and have children, but that all of her children would die young. The fortune teller told her that the only way she could prevent her children from dying young was a human sacrifice. And while Leonardo did not act on the fortune teller's advice right away, it did take up space in the back of her mind. She kept thinking about it. Reportedly, Leonardo also visited a Romani who practiced palm reading and who told her, In your right hand, I see prison. In your left, a criminal asylum. Leonardo was a superstitious woman and took all of these warnings very much to heart. In 1939, Leonardo's son, Giuseppe, who was her eldest son and most favorite child, announced that he was going to enlist in the Italian army. Like many Italians during that time, he wanted to do his part in World War II effort. 
Leonarda believed that her son would likely die at war, as was told in the prophecy, and she was determined to protect him at all costs. She remembered what the fortune teller had said, that she could save her children through a human sacrifice. And so she came to the conclusion that his safety required these human sacrifices, and she was up to the task. She found her victims in three middle-aged women who were all her neighbors. Some sources say that Leonarda was something of a fortune teller herself and that these women all visited her for her help. Others state merely that they were friends of hers seeking advice. Whatever the reason, Leonarda began to plan the deaths of these three women pretty much right away. Today, now more than ever, you need a sneeze guardian in your vehicle. If you or anybody you know are driving for Uber, Lyft, or any other ride shares, keep yourself and your customers safe, especially in the season of flu and other viruses. Even if you don't drive an Uber, the sneeze guardian makes a great gift for your ride share driving friends. Get them a sneeze guardian specifically designed to be used inside their vehicles. Now only $89 includes free shipping. The Sneeze Guardian arrives within a week, so you'll have it in your car protecting you and your clients in no time. Get yours today at sneezeguardian.com or click on the link in my show notes. That's sneezeguardian.com. Now back to tonight's story. The first of Leonardo's victims was a 73-year-old woman by the name of Faustina Setti. Faustina was a lifelong spinster who had come to her for help in finding a husband. Leonarda told her of a suitable mate in Pola, but convinced her to tell nobody of the news. She further convinced Faustina to write letters and postcards to relatives and friends, these to be mailed when she reached Pola, but they were merely to tell them that everything was fine so that no one would become suspicious. An excited Faustina packed her bags, she dyed her gray hair, and then visited Leonarda for the last time for final preparations. During this last visit, Leonarda offered her a glass of drugged wine, then killed her with an axe and dragged the body into a closet. There, she cut it into nine parts, gathering the blood into a basin. In her memoir, titled An Embittered Soul's Confessions, Leonarda described what happened next in her official statement. I threw the pieces into a pot, added seven kilos of caustic soda, which I had bought to make soap, and stirred the whole mixture until the pieces dissolved into a thick, dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied in a nearby septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it had coagulated, dried it in the oven, ground it, and mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine. Kneading all the ingredients together, I made lots of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies who came to visit, though Giuseppe and I also ate them. Some sources also say that Leonarda apparently managed to somehow receive Faustina's life savings payment for her fortune-telling services. But one human sacrifice was not enough to ensure Giuseppe's safety, so Leonarda focused on another lonely neighbor, school teacher Francesca Suavi. Francesca was 55 years old. Leonarda repeated the exact same pattern as with Faustina, but this time she told Francesca that she had found her a fantastic job at a girls' school in northern Italy. Francesca's last visit with Leonarda was on September 5, 1940, and this is when Leonarda drugged her with tainted wine, used the axe, chopped up the body, and made more tea cakes. Leonardo was also somehow able to obtain money from Francesca's disappearance, too. Leonardo's final victim was 53-year-old Virginia Cacioppo, a former soprano, said to have sung at La Scala. For her, Leonardo claimed to have found work as the secretary for a mysterious impresario in Florence. As with the other two women, she was told not to tell a single person where she was going. But Virginia just couldn't keep her mouth closed. She was too excited, so she told several friends that she was about to embark on an adventure and a new job, courtesy of Leonardo, the soap maker. 
On September 30, 1940, Virginia came for a last visit with Leonardo. The pattern to the murder was exactly the same as the first two. According to Leonardo's statement, she said, She ended up in the pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. When it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne. And after a long time on the boil, I was able to make some most acceptable creamy soap. I gave bars to neighbors and acquaintances. The cakes, too, were better. That woman was really sweet. I kind of just <laughs> gagged and threw up in my mouth a little bit reading that. This time, Leonardo took a bunch of the victim's money, jewelry, and public bonds. She raided Virginia's house of valuables and then sold or gifted the victim's clothing, shoes, and jewelry. So while Leonardo would go on to say that she was doing this simply to keep her children safe, clearly this was not her only motive. And although Leonardo thought she had committed the perfect murders, she could not have been more wrong. With her giving away the victim's belongings and Virginia's loose lips about the new job, the jig was about to be up for Leonardo. Virginia had a sister-in-law who became suspicious of her disappearance. She had last been seen going into Leonardo's house, so the sister-in-law went to the police with this information. The police came to investigate the report and arrested Leonardo that day. Leonardo did not confess to the murders until they believed that her son, Giuseppe, was involved in the crime. She only then confessed to the murders, providing detailed accounts of what she had done to save her son from any blame. Her trial was held in 1946, and Leonardo not only confessed everything, but she described in great detail how she cooked and turned her victims into soap and desserts. The observers of her trial noted that she seemed unfazed and unemotional when she was explaining what had happened. Not only had she admitted to killing three innocent women, but eating them and also giving the human soap to neighbors. She was also very proud of the fact that she was assisting her country during wartime. She went on to say, I gave the copper ladle, which I used to skim the fat off the kettles, to my country, which was so badly in need of metal during the last days of the war. Leonardo's trial only lasted a few days. With all of her details and accounts of what happened, I mean, it was pretty clear that she was guilty. Giuseppe also went to trial, but he was acquitted. Both Raphael, which was Leonardo's husband, and Giuseppe always claimed that Leonardo was innocent. But by her own words, it was very clear what she had done. Leonardo was found guilty of the three murders and given the sentence of 30 years in prison and three years in a criminal asylum. Her family hugged her tight after the sentencing. After she was convicted of murdering the three, Leonardo spent the rest of her life behind bars. To stay busy, she wrote her memoirs, titled An Embittered Soul's Confessions. In it, Leonardo wrote about the murders and even offered up helpful hints for how the reader could turn people into soap. She wrote, Basically, you use caustic soda which is an industrial solvent used to break down wood to dissolve human bodies. It can also be used to make a harsh soap if it's mixed with fat or meat from a human. In order to make cake out of a person, she simply let her victim's blood coagulate. Then she dried it in an oven and mixed it with flour. From there, she would use the flour to make cakes and give them out to her neighbors. There, now that's something you know in case you ever felt like you needed to know that. On October 15, 1970, Leonardo died of cerebral apoplexy, a type of hemorrhage. This happened while she was still in the asylum. She was 79 years old. Her body was returned to her family for burial, but her murder weapons, including the pot that her victims were boiled in, were donated to the Criminology Museum in Rome. To this day, museum visitors can see her collection of axes, and peer inside the vat that she used to boil human beings. Now that would be interesting to see. It's believed today that Leonardo likely suffered from clinical depression stemming from the deaths of her 10 children. Today we have a better understanding of what depression and anxiety is and how to treat it, but back then people were known to resort to superstition and paranoia, which is exactly what Leonardo did and what ultimately led her to committing these crimes. Well, that's it for one of the most disturbing cases of a serial killer I've ever heard. 
And for some reason, it makes me want to examine my soap a lot closer. That's it for me tonight. I want to once again thank tonight's sponsor. If you drive a Lyft, Uber, or any other rideshare, get yourself a Sneeze Guardian at sneezeguardian.com. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Mapper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper. Or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. Head over on whatever app you're listening to me on if you don't mind and leave me a review. I super appreciate your support. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer or a Leonardo. Bye.